Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here are your hosts, Monica Profit and Tracy Hazard. Hi, and welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Monica Profit, and I am not interviewing anyone today. Um, I'm doing a new format for the podcast. After talking with Tracy a bit about all kinds of different ideas that I've had that have been um, spurred on and in inspired by blockchain and crypto, I, um, I've always been in her ear about some new idea I have or something else that could happen or a use case or who's, is anyone working on this or do you know someone in that? And she's just like, Monica, why don't you do some podcast episodes by yourself? So I'm just looking at the time here. I'm going to try to um, kind of keep it to the same length as we usually have. Um, so I won't Monica log as I've been told I can do. Um, but yeah, I wanted to talk about a couple of different ideas that I think um, blockchain and crypto have enabled and are enabling and people aren't doing yet. And um, I guess part of my desire to put out ideas in the world that I am not currently necessarily, I don't own them, I'm not doing something about them right now, I hope someone else is. I imagine that in the logic of, of creation, um, all of my ideas do not just belong to me, and there are plenty of other people that are having these ideas at the same time. So if this makes sense to you, or if you know someone who's doing something like this, please um, let me know and, um, and comment or reach out to me or something, because I would love to meet more people that are doing some of the things that I'm thinking about. Um, and also, I, I guess I'm just a little bit driven by the way that my, my stepfather lived his life. His name was Gilbert White, and he was an amazing person. And when he passed away um, in his obituary, somebody had shared a story that got published. And it was just a great, um, it was a perfect testament to his life. And he worked in geography, and um, he had, had kind of penned and, and come up with so many basic uh, fundamental ideas around floodplain management and water management that he was considered the grandfather of floodplain management. So if you can think of a more boring title to die with, that's like, <laughs> that's kind of takes the cake, right? So um, in, this, in this story that I, I try to remember for myself a lot as an innovator and as a person who hopefully has things to contribute to, um, to the world of whatever genres I'm in right now, it's in blockchain, we used to be in art. Um, so he had, he had been uh, coming up with so many great ideas that we, he found himself sitting next to a good friend of his. His friend was telling this story about him after he died. And uh, he, the person on stage at this conference where they were sitting and attending um, was a member of the Army Corps of Engineers, a big fancy dude. And he was basically espousing all of Gilbert's ideas and not giving him credit. He was acting like they were his own ideas. And he was like, and this thing we should do, that's great. And that thing, and we're going to be blah, 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 because I believe that we should... And the man sitting next to Gilbert said, Gilbert, he is using your ideas and espousing them as his own and not giving you credit. You know, his ideas, he's just taking them and using them. And um, Gilbert turned to him and said, I know, isn't it wonderful? And um, as much as I'm out for, uh, you know, building a business and being good at what I do, and, and that means in this particular world, since I'm not in the world of global bureaucracy and water management. <laughs> I'm in the world of business much more than that. Um, then I have to consider what I have and I have IP and things like that. And that's, uh, of course, an unfortunate side effect. But um, in the spirit of really just putting out ideas and actually hoping they take, they take fire and they, they, they are inspiring to others and they actually take root in other people and they get pushed forward. Um, I would much rather give up my pen, my, my, my signature on them than uh, see them not be born or not be um, taken hold of. So, and I hope that I get to meet the other people that think this might be cool and people that might um, criticize or whatever. Any feedback is of course great. Just please don't be a troll, but then that goes for anybody on the internet. Um, but yeah, I, I have this idea that I've been thinking about. Here's the first one. It's called, I've decided to call it cost-based economics. 
And um, it kind of comes out of um, me absolutely hating capitalism for a long time, uh, being a young person and kind of looking at um, luxury goods and thinking like, what a horrible thing, you know, not, not only does it like, we'll reward one, only one person and it gives only, it's something that only some people can have, the extra soft sheets or the Lexus car, whatever it is. Um, but it also acts as a symbol of you can't have what I have. And I'm just like, this is a, it's just such an unfortunate way that we as human beings have chosen to organize ourselves that I am ashamed of us, frankly. <laughs> um, but here we are and this is what we do. And uh, so I, they've just kind of tried to stay away from stuff that I think is just distasteful and that's one of the things. But aside from that, um, I also couldn't help but start thinking about this. And when I was around 18, 19 years old, I was like, why do I hate Lexus cars? And that was part of the reason why. And then I was like, well, you know, what makes this so awful? And I realized it was the scarcity model of capitalism that's underpinning it that was the real problem. It wasn't the car itself. It wasn't if I cared what it looked like. It wasn't that some people could afford it. It was just the scarcity model of, of um, how it was distribute, distributed. And so um, that's it's always been in the background is like how, like, why do I have distaste for certain systems and how could that system shift? So I came up with this idea of cost-based economics that um, with cryptocurrency, I think becomes a lot easier to understand and, um, and, and implement. So because with a cryptocurrency, you can pretty much just take the, uh, the rules of money and strip away all the regulations and all of the rules that have already been there and just like, and then just rebuild it however you want. You know, it's just, it's a completely like um, iterative process. There's nothing, you can just take everything away and then just like start from zero. And I love that. So um, this, in, in this analogy, I can just use a dollar for it, but so you can understand like the process, but you can actually, pop, you could actually um, digitally create a token that would be, that would, that would, uh, that would behave this way inherently. So it wouldn't be just up to how somebody manages it, but it would manage itself, which is a cool thing about crypto. But um, so in my analogy here is uh, in current economics, in our current model, um, say you, it costs you $1,000 to make an app. And I pick an app because it's uh, scalable and it's digital and it um, can serve multiple people because it's made once and it can scale out, right? Um, without additional efforts. Um, and maybe there's some analysis made for efforts here and there to ma maintain or to whatever, but those are nominal, they're small comparatively. So the large idea here is if you make an app and it costs you $1,000, you find some guys in India, they make it, or you find your brother knows how to, whatever it is, and you make it, and this is how much it costs you. So you go to the Apple store and you get a colon colonoscopy and finally you get it on the Apple store. And then um, you put it for a dollar and everybody downloads it for a dollar. So the first thousand downloads, you're just trying to break even. And then after that, uh, it's, all, it's all profit, right? It's all gravy. Like, yay, pie in the sky, go for it. And our ideas around that are, you know, societally, we say that's a good thing, right? It's a great thing. You've, you've, you've now you're in the black once you're not in the red anymore. You've, you've broken even and it's just profit as far as you possibly can. So um, we applaud you for your, for your wonderful, successful business. Um, and, you know, people, if they want to have a conscious business, then the app has to do a conscious thing. But they still ultimately might want to do a conscious thing. But like, ultimately, they want to get their pie in the sky. Like they, and, and once you really get there, then, we, of course, our sentiment really changes, right? Because as a collective, as a society, as a global world, we're going like, well, if you, but if you're too far, like, hey, Jeff Bezos, like, you need to pay some taxes. Or, um, hey, Microsoft, we have some antitrust suits for you. Or we need more healthy you know, uh, competition in the market. You know, you can't be the only one. So we applaud people for doing it and being successful in this price-driven business up to a point. Um, and then, you know, if they're really successful by those, those you know, metrics of only money, um, and then, then at some point we want to scale it back. And if they're, if they're really successful, of course, like by doing unscrupulous things like taking a $5 insulin shot and turning it into a $300 insulin shot. Well, we don't really applaud that anymore, but isn't that strange because we would applaud it if they, if they did it fair and square for five, like we had these rules around this price-based economic model that kind of try to curb it. Um, and mine is a cost-based economic model. So part of my um, life, I spent being a bohemian artist. I had no interest in money uh, and in making much of it. I mean, I was good at saving, but um, I didn't really want to go out and trade my hours for too many dollars because I liked my hours and I was spending my hours making art and doing things. And so the best thing that I could do with my time would be to um, be making something new or thinking a new thought, <laughs> not uh, giving it to somebody for dollars too often. So I did my best to avoid the economic system. 
and it was great. Um, but along the way, I also saw that I, there are two ways of looking at value when there's time and there's space. Those are the things that make up physical reality. And most people are enticed by space and they can, they can get things. They can get a nicer apartment. They can get a nicer car. They can have that Lexus, whatever it is, luxury items, non-luxury items, better food by having more money. And so they can be enticed to sell their time for this money thing because the money thing can get them space back and like space, you can get so much more, but it's like, we, you can always get a bigger apartment. You can always work harder for something else. Like that's something that you can never, there's not supposed to be a limit on it, right? And a lot of disparities issues would show that, yeah, there's limits on it, but still the idea here is that you can go on and on. But time, I mean, as a resource, you have no idea how much you have. I could keel over in 30 seconds right here and this thing would just go and like, I don't know, eventually just stop and someone would come in and find me dead and like maybe this would be published posthumously. But like, I have no idea how much time I have. You don't either. It is the most precious thing and that is what drove me in my economic decisions for a really long time. So in trying to, I realized that for you to feel like you have, um, wealth of some sort it's just this difference between how much you need and how much you have and as long as there's a cushion between there you pretty much can have some sense of relative stability if you if you absolutely need more than you have you're in a you're in a pickle so um i instead of trying to expand how much i had i just tried to reduce how much i needed and keep that buffer there so i could expand the buffer by needing less and that was always my approach. So um, fast forward to now when I'm like doing way more capitalist things. And, um, but I'm still thinking that way. I'm still thinking, you know, how do these incentive systems actually work long term? So um, in an alternative cost-based model, if you were to build an app and it costs you $1,000 to build, um, uh, once you reach $1,000, it's now back to where it started. But the one thing that you didn't add into your, into your kind of economics there is um, how much you pay yourself, right? When you go to build a business, you're just like, just throw everything at it. But what if you said, you know what? Um, I, I'd be happy if I just made, if I made $100,000 on this app, I would be thrilled. And um, outside of that, whatever. Um, or I wanna get paid this much for what I do, right? And what I do is build apps or whatever. So this is how much it is. I will cap it at this price, to, or at the cost here. So the cost for me is this. And I will, um, along with, you know, and you could use it for an organization, you could use it for the MTA system, whatever there is, wherever you know there's actually an absolute cost level limit to it, you say, here's what it is. So let's just for argument's sake, and there are plenty of incentives that are not necessarily aligned here, but let's just say for argument's sake, I say, I wanna make $100,000 on my app. So I go to the app store, get a colonoscopy, like uh, uh, a dollar a, a download and the first 100,000. So I get 99,000 and my developers get one, and that's somehow fair too, I don't know. Um, anyway, so then we have 100,000 downloads at a dollar a piece, and now we've broken even, and I got paid what I wanted to get paid, and everything is done, and there's this app that exists in the world. And if I capped what I get, because I don't have this belief system that like, if I invent something cool, I should be infinitely rewarded for it. What if I can be rewarded up to a point without taxes coming into the, like, it's not because at some point I have to be taxed at a higher rate or whatever, just like, nope, I did a thing in the world, they liked it, they needed it, they bought it, I named my price, and I got it. Done. So what happens when the next 100,000 people download it? Well, in this model, um, barring it needing to be maintained or like small things that, that on an ongoing basis need to be paid for, let's just say as a system itself, it's a static thing and it's fine for just easy numbers. So the next 100,000 people, now there's 200,000 downloads and they've put in a dollar, but now they've all been refunded 50 cents. Because if they used a cryptocurrency that was functioning this way, it would be automatic. So like with their, with their app comes a wallet with, a, with no cryptocurrency in it because they spent a dollar, but as soon as the number of app downloads is noticed by each wallet on the blockchain, then suddenly everyone gets 50 cents because now they've only paid 50 cents for it because they put in a dollar and they have 50 cents back. And then we get, and it scales out until basically you put in a dollar and you have 99 cents in your, in your account. You put in a dollar, it basically drives the cost down to free. And I got my price. I don't get to be Mr. Greedy. No one gets to come back and say, well, well all I can say is like, I made something that everybody in the world wanted. Um, but I named my price. So this, this sounds like insane to most people because they're like, no, 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 it's the whole point. There's no incentive to make anything. Well. I can't help but think 
about what's coming in the post AI future. Um, and, and this is where I'm like, I just think all the rules are going to be changing soon and in a way that we can't totally adjust to yet. Elon Musk, for whatever it's worth, was saying, um, you know, our, our post, our AI world, or our post AI world is not going to create a, um, a crisis of work or of employment. It's going to create a crisis of meaning. And um, when I see the, I've done a little bit of research around this and I just see there's like a, at some point a future where there's a basic universal basic income and there is an AI driven, like rote, rote problems are taken care of by non-people. And so the idea that you would do, you would trade your time for a rote cause, to do a rote thing and, and get money for it. So then you can go consume something and like spin around is, um, is kind of gonna be eroded. And in that erosion, as Elon Musk said, that we're gonna have more of a crisis of meaning. And that meaning is gonna, I think, can be driven more by, rather than being like, okay, I've, I'm going after space, I'm, you know, I'm trading all of my dollars for time, you know, my time for these dollars to get this stuff that makes me look good, and then dollars and then stuff, good, look good. Consumer-driven capitalism, late-stage capitalism, in the worst, in the worst sense, well, what about post-capitalism? Where it's still, as a capitalist, there's still an exchange rate. It's just that it, it folds back in on itself. So that every good invention actually goes back to benefit everybody. And you can name your price, but that's your price because you have a fixed price. Why? Also, because you have a freaking basic income. How much do you need? At some point, isn't your crisis of meaning, not of money? So like, okay, you don't get a yacht. If that's really your crisis, the next thing you better find a nice way to market around your $3 million price tag for your next app. And if you can get people to do that, great. Maybe you can, I don't know. But, it, um, but this is just a way that I, I think you can formalize the um, recirculation of, ex of, of externalities and also like resources. So rather than someone saying, oh, we wanna be mission driven, you know, kind of, yeah, right. You want to be mission driven. You want to make a bunch of money. It's the same thing as anybody else, but you just don't want to feel horrible and kill people in the third world over it, which, which is commendable. Although honestly, a pretty low bar for me to applaud over, you know, um, ultimately, how are you trying to truly redistribute our resources? Or are you trying to make your greasy buck by not having blood on your hands? And at what point do you call it blood on your hands? <laughs> So like, I just, I can't think of the whole system as something that is a little grotesque right now and um, needs kind of an overhaul. And I think cryptocurrency gives us the tools to potentially overhaul that. So when people say, oh, well, that wouldn't work, there's no incentives. I'm like, well, bullshit, first of all, there are plenty of social businesses. Mohammed Yunus got the freaking Nobel Peace Prize for his work in, in um, social business and, and you know, mission-driven economic models. So I call bullshit. Um, and if you take that, not just to the extreme of like, yes, people do want to do good. It's true, they do. That's why there's what we call conscious business right now. But if you take it further out and you start to see the effect of viral marketing, when someone says, hey, if I get my friend to sign up, I get money back in my account. If we all get this, if this, if this continues to work, if we continue to spread this, if it continues to be a good app for this many people or whatever, great. Another um, uh, use case that I've thought of that is kind of similar is it's got a fixed cost. So anything that's got a fixed cost and can scale up in terms of how many people it serves. So because New York City is magical and wonderful, I was on the subway um, about a couple weeks ago. And I um, just happened to be standing next to this guy and his wife and their kid in a stroller. And they took up a lot of space because the stroller, you know, and it was like crowded and he's like leans further into me and I'm like against the door and he's like, I'm sorry. And I'm like, it's okay. And he's like, it's just so crowded. And I said, it's collectively all of our faults that it's crowded. So don't say you're sorry. We're all sorry. And he was like, ah, ha, ha. You know, we like had a moment. And, um, and he's like, I used to work for the MTA. And I was thinking, I had just been thinking like, I wonder how much it costs to run the MTA for a year. Um, Cause that would be a cool, could I like use that as a use case in this like discussion around this model? Hmm, cost-based transportational model. I don't know. So he, I was like, oh, you used to work for MTA. So now he's like talking. I'm like, okay, I love New York. You're just, thank you, New York, for sending me what I need. Um, and I said, well, that's funny because I've been working on an economic model. And I was wondering if you could tell me how much it costs to run the NTA for a year, including like, a, you know, like all of this stuff, including like capital improvements, like an amortized over time. Blah, blah, blah. What's the, like, the mass total budget? And he was like, well, I did leave the position about eight years ago. So if we were to do that, I was like, yeah, so it probably has gone up a good like 20% at least in that period. Of time. He's like, yeah, oh, I'd say, you know, $100 million because it used to run at like 60. And I was like, 
that's safe to say, I'll just say 100 million a year. So let's just pretend now that it costs $100 million a year to run the MTA subway system in New York City per year. So, okay. Um, so the first 100 million people, 100 million rides, and if everybody's like doing two rides a day, like, okay, let's just say we can probably get 100 million rides out of people in a year. I think that's, I don't know the, the usage stats on this, but I think in a city of eight and a half million with commuters the way that we are, we probably get over 100 million users because also we're paying 275 a, a ride right now. Don't know why, but here we go. So um, if we had 100 million users, 100 million rides at a dollar a ride, great. We reached our limit, right? Why do we need more than 100 million? We just said that, we had a fixed cost. So then what happens if we all of our MTA cards as New York City residents, we get, next time we, we, we swipe it, it's only cost us 50 cents. And then the, 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 it keeps going down and down and down until we have all of the money back in our, in our, on our card and we just replenish it the next year, right? Or we have to pay that same first ride or we have to pay up until that first 100 million and then it just replenishes back in. And maybe with inflation next year, it'll be 110 or 15 or whatever. But we can basically see it come back. And then, aha, what about this? The sociolo sociologist in me is excited about like what this can mean for how much I really get frustrated by tourists. Part of that reason that that train was so freaking packed was because we had lots of tourists just didn't know where they were going, looking at their old maps and you know, walking slow, you know, all the things tourists do. And, uh, but what if they come and they don't get the, the resident card? Because they don't really come very often. They don't need to have a, a lasting incentive to keep riding the MTA. They're going to be here for a week. So they just get the regular card. And that's just extra money that goes in. So then the more of them that come in, they don't get the refund money. We do, because we're the, we're the ones that live here and pay taxes here and stuff. So now we, we like tourists, right? Because they're driving the price of our subway rides down all year long and they're only here for some time. So um, I think there are ways to systematize circular economies and incentives and, and use, use, use incentives and the benefits thereof so that you can, and also you can potentially lose a lot of, of um, pork and friction and, and like additional like compliance costs by having to always audit things in the same way. I mean, blockchain and its immutability, there's a lot of opportunity for that. And I'm not gonna get into compliance too much, but it would be interesting to see something with a fixed cost that has a scalability of, of uh, utility and of access be utilized in this manner. So like, if you know Richard Branson, uh, please forward him this. I think he does a lot of cool social innovation stuff. You know any other like, you know, big rich people that wanna, that are visionaries that wanna do something very cool in a certain environment. Um, Necker Island might be a good place. I don't know, like, I don't know if they have a bus system there though. It seems more like a yacht system. So maybe like somewhere in the Bahamas or some closed system that needs, um, that has a, a fixed cost and enough, especially external money coming in, that they'd like to see directly recirculated to their population. That might be a vehicle for doing so. Um, I can think of transportation for it. I can think of digital products for it. Um, yeah, anything that has a, a relatively fixed or predictable cost and uh, has minimal systems around it um, and can scale in terms of usability and hopefully has engagement from a lot of um, ex um, external participants so that you could potentially watch wealth go directly back into the user base that is local. So um, there's my idea, it's called, I've called it cost-based economics and I'm gonna keep using the app um, um, analogy because it just seems simple and I won't get as many people saying like, well, that's not how much it actually costs to run the MTA or whatever, it's like it's just an app, you know? Um, but I hope that that illustrates the idea and I hope that if you know anybody who's doing anything like this, um, if you have any uh, input on it, I think this will work best on a proof of stake chain. There's no reason for a proof of work chain, um, which means a private chain to some degree. Um, uh, there's some guys at MIT and Algorand who have talked about, uh, talked with about this. They're very excited and interested in it. Um, so I'm just working on publishing something. And I hope that if you have an application for this, that you reach out. And if you're working on something that uses this, or if you want to use something like this, I'd love to advise on that and help. Uh, I think it's a good idea. Um, I think it's first easy iterations will be in the nonprofit world because people won't be as threatened by the notion of, of what a different capitalist system would look like. 
Um, but I think cost-based economics is going to be more and more useful as we have uh, different incentives come about in a post AI and post um, universal basic income world. So maybe I'm just speaking into a camera 50 years too soon. But anyway, um, thank you so much for listening. This was the New Crest Economy, Monica Log style, and I will catch you next time on our podcast. Thanks a lot, you guys. Bye. You've been listening to The New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring The New Trust Economy with us.